Hi, my name is Walker Brandt, and you might remember me as Cadet Gina Jar from Star Trek The Next Generation, the episode The First Duty. I'm looking forward to spending some time with you on Trek Untold. Welcome back to Trek Untold, the Star Trek podcast that goes beyond the stars. I'm your host, Matthew Kavalewitz. If you're as big of a fan of Star Trek as I imagine you must be if you're listening to this show, then chances are at some point in your life you dreamed of attending Starfleet Academy. Really, who wouldn't want to be part of a starship? Seeking out new life and civilizations and all that jazz. Well, literally jazz if you're actually Will Riker, but that's a different story. But sadly, we can't live that reality, at least not yet, but we can still imagine it. Today's guest was lucky enough not to have to imagine it as much as the rest of us do, because she was able to actually become a Starfleet cadet. That guest is Walker Brandt. Walker appeared on the fifth season episode of TNG titled The First Duty, where she played cadet Jean Hajar. This episode marked the first time Starfleet Academy ever appeared on screen in the franchise, and it's also regarded as one of the best episodes of the series. For a young Walker, this was in fact her first TV gig, and it was a heck of a way to get an introduction to that world. If you think making your TV debut on a Star Trek show is big, how about making your first two films with Billy Crystal and Martin Sheen, respectively? Walker has had a heck of a career on screen, and that led her to some great opportunities abroad, including meeting Nelson Mandela in Africa and seeing parts of Germany that had previously not been seen that much not long after the Berlin Wall had fallen. The fact that she accomplished all of this while working to overcome a very turbulent childhood shows the mettle of this person, and it led her down the latest road of her life where she's become an author, with her new book, Awaken, Discovering Yourself Through the Light of Your Innocence. We're going to talk about all of this and much more in today's episode, so get ready for a truly fascinating chat with this week's guest. Before we begin this episode, I'd like to remind you to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Trek Untold. All one word, no spaces. If you want to check out some of our Trek Untold merchandise, you can also do that on our Teespring store, which you can find on teespring.com slash stores slash Trek Untold where we've got shirts, hoodies, mugs, stickers, tote bags, and all sorts of other things available to proudly display how much you like this podcast. If you're having trouble finding the link, just check us out again on social media, and you'll see us posting about it from time to time there as well. You can also support our show by visiting patreon.com slash trekuntold. If you're already following us or offering us your support, thank you for your help. Most of all, if you can't support us financially, Please make sure to subscribe to the podcast and leave us a rating and review on iTunes or wherever you're listening to the show. This helps more people find out about the show and helps spread awareness of Trek Untold. I'd also like to make a quick shout out to our friends at Triple Fiction Productions, who make some great 3D printed Star Trek inspired products for toys and people, but you'll hear more about them a little bit later on. Now, without further ado, let's beam up this week's guest. Computer, access interview file. Affirmative. Initiating program. And welcome back to Trek Untold, and joining me now on the other side of the line, you know her from Starfleet Academy, we've got Walker Brandt here with us. Walker, how's it going today? Hi, it's going great, actually, <laughs> except for the isolation still, but other than that, it's all good. <laughs> yeah, it's been crazy doing all these interviews basically right as the quarantine period started around the U.S., and uh, you know, at the time we're recording this, it still hasn't really changed much, um, but yeah, I hope you're keeping sane over there. Yeah, as best I can. Um, yeah, you know, you just gotta, you gotta roll with it as much as you can. It's it's at the point now where it's been so long that we're all sort sort of creating this um, normal <laughs> acceptance of it, which is a little bit unnerving. <laughs> I mean, I'll be honest with you, I don't even know what day it is anymore, unless it's like a Thursday, because that's when I release the new episodes of the show. Otherwise, I have no idea what day it is. Exactly, exactly. Oh, gosh. When we, Yeah, I remember my husband and I were looking at each other for a few weeks after. How do we keep missing Wednesday? Why is it that Wednesday keeps leaving our calendar? What happened to Wednesday? I remember Wednesdays. <laughs> exactly. So I'm right there with you. I totally understand. We'll see when we all come out of this. We're going to be in an interesting, uh, it's almost like becoming another uh, an we are evolving because, you know, everything changes from moment to moment, but this is a new evolution for us for sure. And uh, I hope it's a, a better evolution. I hope we come out 
with more understanding and more uh, um, more grace and uh, wiser for it. It's not just that we've been trapped in a cage and we all come out like bats at dusk. <laughs> I mean, I think at this point, we're basically living in the Star Trek timeline right before Starfleet begins. We're almost close to those Bell Riots now, if we're not already in them. So we're, we're getting close at least to some kind of space utopia. That much is true. Yes, no question. No question. All right, so Walker, uh, I'd like to get started and ask you the question that we ask all of our guests when they first pop onto our show. And that's, what's your earliest memory of Star Trek? Oh, my goodness. Um, gosh, probably three three years old, maybe, maybe a, a little bit earlier. My mom watched the original and um, she was, I, you know, she's a Trekkie for sure. Um, and in her generation, no question, it was a moment in the house every day or every week when it was on and uh, sci-fi in general was. So I remember, I remember Star Trek really young. It's one of the first shows that when I think about TV and its impact on me is, is one of the first shows. And those furry little creatures, I remember those furry little creatures that kept expanding and expanding. Oh, the tribbles? The, the tribbles from being a uh, child <clears throat> playing with toys and fuzzy, you know, you just love fuzzy things. I remember that episode impacted me and how they were everywhere. And it looked like such a fun thing to be able to just snuggle with these furry little creatures. And I remember watching my mom's face go from, oh, how cute to, oh my gosh, and them <laughs> not being cute anymore and how it impacted me because they never, they never changed from being appealing to me, but to my mom, they were not. <laughs> <laughs> By the end of the episode, they wanted them gone. I didn't understand that. <laughs> So tell us a little bit about where you grew up, who your parents were, and what little Walker wanted to be when she grew up. Um, I grew up in Santa Barbara, California for most of my young childhood. Um, and uh, if you've read my book, my childhood was was pretty rough. <laughs> uh, watching some of the uh, some of the TV stuff was my escape, but that wasn't really that was one thing that we were allowed to do once a week. So. Um, it, my time as a child was spent out in nature. That was where I found my sanctuary and my solace. And uh, my family was a um, had an alcoholic and violent le legacy on my mother's side of the family, unfortunately. But it, it, it just was what it was. And uh, when you grow up in an environment like that, it uh, drives you inside. And for me, my imagination was my best friend and my uh, my uh, guide with spirit to navigate this new experience of life that I was in as a child. And uh, I, as I spent time out in nature, I, I explored in a very expansive way. I was taught through that experience how to open instead of close the doors. So as a, as a kid, it's the one thing I think I wanted more than anything was to be free. I never really thought of a, what do you want to be when you grow up kind of a narrative, because when you're in that kind of environment, you just want to get through, at least for me, it was, I just wanted to get through each day. Uh, you're, you're preoccupied with safety and you're preoccupied with survival. And you've got these different kinds of experiences going on when you're in that, that turbulent environment. So I, I didn't think about what I wanted to be until I was a young teen. And that was first thing was veterinar veterinarian. I wanted to be, I loved animals. I have, have a natural uh, gift with animals that just, they come to me, I go to them. <laughs> they respond to me, I respond to them. I can sense their energy, they sense mine, and I feel safe with them and they feel safe with me. And that's just kind of been my thing as a, as a young kid exploring nature in Santa Barbara, in the Los Padres Forest, it was very wild out there. There weren't a lot of people where we lived. And I'd go for miles, and I'd see all kinds of creatures, uh, big and small, and dangerous and not so dangerous. And they all just responded to my energy um, in a very 
sort of you're part of the environment way. And, uh, and so that was my first experience of acceptance and feeling really connected to this experience of life. So that's, I think, where becoming a veterinarian came into my mind. And, uh, and then things went a little, int- got really intense in my, in my childhood. Um, and I ended up leaving at a very young age. So that was not on the table. It was about getting out there in the world. And uh, I was emancipated at 16, and I went to school and studied uh, psychology and child development to try and understand myself. And then I, um, and then I, I just was through random circumstance uh, directed into this field. Uh, never in a million years would I have ever thought I would have been a model or an actor or anything in the entertainment industry. It just wasn't something that was in my sphere growing up. And it wasn't something I didn't, I didn't look at myself very often on the outside. I was very much on the inside. So I didn't understand the appeal of what you looked like on the outside until I was much older and uh, directed in that, that arena and learned that combining the two could, could serve to create a fun career. <laughs> Yeah, as part of my research uh, to get ready for this interview, I read your book, which is titled Awaken, Discovering Yourself Through the Light of Your Innocence. And we'll talk a little bit more about that book later. I don't want to spend uh, our whole time together bringing up bad memories either, um, since that's not really, you know, what we want to do on this show. It's all about positivity and kind of spreading awareness of what's going on. But uh, I'm glad to hear that you got through everything and got through your journey to where you are today. And uh, especially for someone, you know, we talk about a teenager or young adult who's going through all these very introspective, self-reflective things. I mean, that's that's a, a tough childhood to go through. So again, I'm just very happy to be able to talk to you today and to know that you got through it and came out great on the end. Yeah, I, I look at it as a positive. I'm a silver lining girl. So I don't look at anything. Um, un- interestingly enough, uh, when I talk to people about this, they think it's it's totally understandable that it'll go, I don't want you to go through those. Those memories to me aren't bad memories anymore, which is really uh, a gift that uh, we'll talk about, I'm sure, at some point through this Um so thank you. For, I appreciate that. I, for me, it's like, you know, I've been graced with that ability to um, flip the script and uh, because of the path I took and uh, the memories are uh, part of my journey and they are part of what make, gave me the life that I have. So I look at them as little gifts and, um, and I always have had that nature of the silver lining. And even in this experience we're going to right now, Hard to imagine, but there are some silver linings. If you seek them, they're there. (laughs) They're there. They're around us. (laughs) You just have to look for them. Very true. So before we get into your acting career, I did want to ask a little bit about modeling, since you mentioned that that came essentially before you got really deep into acting. Uh, And I read you you got discovered essentially in L.A. Is that correct? Yes, I did. I did. I had somebody come up to me and say, hey, you should be, uh, I'd like to take pictures of you. You should be a model. And I literally laughed. It made me laugh because I thought this is crazy. I'm not. I'm not. What is that? First of all, and I'm not. I'm not a model. And uh, I was. I was in school. I was. I wanted to be a psychologist at that point. Um, I was in college. I was studying uh, JC. I was studying child psychology, and I was like, I'm determined to go help people, <laughs> <laughs> help them fix. You know, and 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 uh, I was. You know, I was in my own uh, self recovery. So, and helping. Uh, I wanted to help others do the same. So, uh, yeah. It was bizarre. Uh, it was a bizarre experience to be um, to be uh, asked to do that, and then eventually, after friends encouraged, encouraged, and said, "No, you should you should try it. I think it might work." I finally did, and yeah, it did. It, it worked. It was a huge door that opened, um, and I I walked right through it and moved to Italy. Uh, not long after um, I started, I'm, I'm an adventurer in in my spirit, so I'm definitely an explorer. And uh, I just the thought of going to another part of the world uh, that I've never seen, that I didn't speak the language, that I didn't know anything about, was very appealing to me to explore uh, more of what we are as human beings. So that's. I, I hopped on a plane and took my 
the few things I had and moved over there for for a long time, for a few, couple of years. I flew back and forth a few times, but I was there for a while, <laughs> and it was great. So, uh, yeah, that's that's how that rolled out. And then I came back and worked here, and, and then acting kind of came at me the same exact way. <laughs> I read that you got to meet Nelson Mandela when you went on a trip to Africa, and that was apparently a very, very huge, important trip for you. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about meeting Nelson Mandela and your time over there? Yes, that was one of those moments in life that is a pivotal moment. I was on one of the first, I think it was the first film I had done, maybe the second, early, early career, and um, working with uh, Martin Sheen which was a huge deal in and of itself because I loved his work and Jürgen Prochnow and Corbin Burnson was huge on uh, LA Law and there were just all these you know established talented actors and here I was on this set with them learning this craft and um, in another country which I, which is to me one of the most beautiful countries my gosh uh, South Africa is amazing the continent uh, is amazing. South Africa is, is really, really beautiful. And uh, you feel like you're at the beginning of everything there. And uh, when, when Martin called the evening before after we had worked and asked if I wanted to go the next morning to meet Nelson, it was, it was one of those moments in life you have no idea what's about to happen to you. I had no idea. I was very young and I knew who Nelson Mandela was, but I didn't know to the extent of who he was. Yeah, I was, you know how we are when we're in our 20s. We're so focused on what we're trying to accomplish uh, when we're young and we tend to, our, our world becomes very close. We kind of expand, at least then, it was a different kind of a society where you, you know, everybody's driven to achieve, achieve, achieve. And, and, and we didn't have technology. We didn't have access to the world the way we do now. So you know who, people are, but you don't really know them like you do now, you just, or you didn't then. And so I didn't have the gift to, re, to understand who he was like uh, Martin did. Martin was an activist, or is an activist, and he uh, spends his life in that arena. So he knew very clearly who Nelson Mandela was. So when we walked in, or when uh, Martin picked me up, he uh, and, and the other two uh, three individuals that came with, he educated us in the car because he had the luxury and the understanding of who, um, of traveling and doing all the things we couldn't do. And he was very generous that way. He said, you know, I've, I've been at this a long time and, and I've been able to spend time with people like Nelson for years and I'd like to share this with you. And so he gave us a little history of, of his experience and educated us on who Mar uh, Nelson really was, who Martin was too. And uh, and when I walked in the room with this man, I did not expect what hit me was, and I had been throughout my life sensitive to energy. I'm an energy person. Uh, we all are, but I, I sense I sense energy more than people, um, what they present. I feel, I just feel energy. And I think it, it's what the animals, being in nature with animals gave me as a little gift is because they sense energy. So I got really sensitive to that frequency and recognized when my energy would not make an animal behave a way that I hoped that they would. And I knew I could change it instantly with shifting my energy. So when I walked in the room with Nelson, the energy that came at me was so different than any energy I'd ever experienced from a person before. It was such open graciousness and joy. That was an amazing thing. It was like a child. It was like an innocent child um, that I later experienced. I thought, oh my gosh, that's what this is. This is the innocence. That's what it was he had. He had that joy and innocence that kids have, that openness. And then when you thought about what he went through and to have that, to leave his isolation with that kind of expansion and that kind of openness and that kind of graciousness, it, it really was profound. And uh, we had such a great time in the office with him. 
We learned about what he wanted to do. He shared the intensity of what he was doing. We talked about acting, the craft of acting, of which he was a huge fan. He loved, loved, loved the craft of acting and was a huge fan, again, of Martin Sheen and Apocalypse Now. Man, he turned into an excited teenager when he was talking about that. <laughs> yeah, and that movie we were talking about that you were in was uh, Trigger Fest from 1994, and that must have been an amazing set to work on. It's, it's a Western movie with big sets. Uh, you know, can you tell us a little bit about your time on that movie? Yeah, that was a lot of fun. We, um, The thing that was the most interesting about that is when I flew into South Africa and into Joburg, it amazed me how much it looked like Texas. It looked so much like Texas, except there were giraffes on the horizon. <laughs> you know, there were just different animals there. And, uh, yeah, we had this set out in, um, you know, out in out in this this plane. And every now and again, we'd see a giraffe, you know, out in the distance. And uh, it was an incredible experience. The people, the actors that I got to work with and uh, being on that set as a new actor, you know, a, a greenhorn for sure, inhabiting the characters as deeply and as authentically as possible and and trying to not be in awe <laughs> as the fan of how did I get here? And I can't believe I'm in a scene with Martin Sheen and you're in Prague now, <laughs> you know, trying to stay in the character when you're that new in the, in the business, when you're working with people like that, it was really, I think that's the thing that stands out the most for me is how I kept trying so hard <laughs> to not lose character. <laughs> Because I just wanted to be the fan, you know? I was just like, oh, my God. Like, oh my God. <laughs> that, that's why you're one of us at the end of the day. <laughs> exactly. You got it. So that was that was, was wonderful, those experiences. And, uh, you know, seeing this new country, meeting uh, people that, uh, you know, have this completely different society and experience over there and all the changes that were happening and going out into um, – some of the tribal areas that were, it was like walking back in time. And I, one thing I noticed amongst most people out in the um, more remote areas is the joy and the lightness of their spirit. Just the excitement to see us and to share their culture and to share who they were. Um, yeah, it was a very expansive learning experience for me in a, in a yeah, it, it changed me forever, especially the uh, once I left the office with Nelson Mandela and what it did to me physically. Um, as you read in the book, it, I, I involuntarily cried and uh, I didn't know why it was happening. And Martin enlight, enlightened me on why it was happening. And and I'm, it's never left me throughout my whole life. Um, Nelson Mandela touched my the deepest part of who I am. He touched my spirit. He touched my soul. He touched the, the, the essence of me that came before this identity, that I, the soul of, of, of what I am. He connected the, the part of us, the essence of all of us, the light that we are. And he um, he opened that door with that joy. It's a powerful thing to choose peace, to choose joy, to choose smiling, and to choose to be happy is something he did in the face of incredible injustice and um, and uh, contrary energy and experience around him. He kept choosing and choosing and choosing, and he came out of it with a spirit that was able to change the world and ripple, you know, create a ripple in the world that changed an entire country and rippled out to the rest of the world. And um, yeah, to be to be in the presence of somebody like that and, and share just casual conversation and have them care enough to look you in the eye and really touch you that way and appreciate you, really appreciate you. I guess that's what it comes down to is the appreciation for all humanity we had. Yeah, that sounds like an amazing experience. If you don't mind, I'm going to actually take a few steps backwards for a minute. I want to go back into uh, basically your, your acting origin. Uh, so from modeling, you eventually got into acting, and you trained under the legendary Uta Hagen. 
Mm. whose list of students mm. is amazing. I mean, if, if you if folks don't know about who she is, she, this is a person you need to know. Uda's responsible for Gene Wilder, Robert De Niro. Uh, the list goes on and on. Uh, and, you know, she's been critical of so many people's careers. And, you know, I, I've heard so many amazing things about her. Uh, what was it like to be taught by Uda? Well, I was, I, my study was her work. I wasn't able to actually work with her um, because by the time I came into it, no, my first study was Uta Hagen's book, Respect for Acting with Her. And, um, and uh, Bruno Kirby is the one who studied with her. And he's the one who was my first, you know, that was my first film, City Slickers. And he is who told me if I could work with Uta, she would be the one to work with, but she didn't have any availability. So I worked with uh, she wasn't taking these students, and she was in New York, and I was in L.A. at the time. And so I studied her book just as intensely as one could without being in the room with her and with actors that had studied with her and worked with Roy London, who was somebody in L.A. who had the respect of Uta Hagen. So her history, her her timing i wish that you know i would have had to have been about 10 years older to have really been able to take advantage of studying with uta hagen because by the time she was you know i got into it she was not as um she was not taking students that were not you know like like robert de niro <laughs> she didn't have the time she was very very busy with her you know a lister uh groups which is you know understandable but I, you know, the, the teachers, the masters that I was able to sit in the room with um, and learn from, Roy London and Larry Moss. Uh, Larry Moss is, he's our generation, Buda Hogg is. He's that, he's a master and um, an amazing, amazing teacher. I don't know if you know much about Larry Moss, but he, uh, he was who I was able to um, really dive deep into the craft with um, once I had spent a couple of years working through Uda's uh, techniques and her training and her her work from afar and with actors that study with her. So that was my history with Uda Hagen. I wish I could have been in the room with her. I wanted to very badly, but uh, not my, my career and my timing was not with hers to be able to get into her situation. Uh, Larry is just as much of a legend as well, though, as you mentioned. I mean, he's another guy that's worked with a lot of very top A-list talent. Uh, again, too many to name, but uh, do you remember one lesson you learned from Larry in particular that really stuck with you? Yeah, his master class, what we used to, our exercises that we used to do. The lesson, I think the most important lesson from Larry is, one, it's never too late for any actor to be an actor. If it's your your dream, your calling, your art, it's never too late. Actors do this to themselves and the industry does that to actors. And he just didn't buy into that. So he would always let actors know, always be prepared and be true to your dream, be true to your craft and know that you'll always have opportunity you will always have an opportunity. He was always open to opportunity and never let that limiting belief that what we do to, you know, the limiting belief, belief that we often box ourselves in with get in the way of the art. He always pushed that out. And the exercises that he did with us to open us and to connect with one another and to reach that authentic place of inhabiting the reality of the character. He was so meticulous about, and is, no doubt, so meticulous. I imagine he's only gotten more uh, over the years about each nuance that makes human beings so interesting and giving yourself the freedom to be in that without judgment. That's probably the most important lesson of Larry Moffitt for me was his acceptance of all the facets of what humanity is and what we are and to play them as truthfully and authentically as you can. Don't, don't hide 
what your mind tells you is not appealing. Human beings are complex and trying to, to be something because it looks better or you think it's more acceptable isn't truth. And acting, the craft of acting is truth, no matter how difficult it is to present in whatever circumstance it is you're performing. You've got to be in your truth there. You've got to be in the truth of the moment. Yeah, that's a great lesson to learn. It's a life lesson. That's where I parallel acting and life are the craft of acting and life are very similar. We're on the stage of life. Acting is on a stage within the stage of life, sharing stories of life. So it's really important to, to keep it truthful. I'm like, how do I even take it from there? Cause that's such a good piece of advice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to jump into your first role, at least your first role according to IMDb and sometimes they're not right. But uh, the first role I see that I believe you were in was in city slickers. And, uh, you did a scene with Jake Gyllenhaal in that movie, correct? <laughs> yes, I did. Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah, so I mean, tell us a little bit about working with a young Jake Gyllenhaal. This is before he was like really big. Uh, what do you remember from that? Oh my gosh, he was such a little uh, ball of energy and a little, a little. he's like class clown. That's all I can say. He's like the class clown. He was the set clown. He was constantly making people laugh. That's, he was constantly, constantly making people laugh. It was so funny. He just had all this energy. And that little thing he did with his arm, I don't know if that was scripted or he just came up with it because it was, I don't remember in the moment of what he, you know, how that just randomly came out where he was making his arm. You know, we all, all kids love that, especially boys. I can make my arm sound like a toot. I'm going <laughs> to do this to all the adults in the room and I'm going to make them all laugh at me. And, uh, and, you know, little things like that he'd do and little, um, little uh, funny stuff. And, yeah, that was off set. But the, but the, the line that he gave me of, uh, you know, my mom said, and the way he said it, it was so his personality. He was definitely being himself in that scene. And uh, it was great working with him. And I remember watching him evolve as an actor and become this, you know, superstar that he is. And uh, not surprised at all. <laughs> <laughs> say that i'm not surprised at all <laughs> he was wonderful did you get to interact with billy crystal or daniel cern or bruno kirby at all on set i did yes um my scenes were with billy crystal which were the best my audition was with billy crystal bruno kirby our director uh, ron underwood and the casting director pam dixon and uh wow what an experience that was because <laughs> we just got to improvise. I just came in the room and they said, uh, here's the scene. What would you say? <laughs> Let's improvise the scene. And I, and you know, I was brand new. I was, I mean, we're talking neon green. <laughs> I was a greenhorn, neon greenhorn. I was brand new. I had no training and I was just, you know, grateful to be there, excited to be in the room with these amazing people. They were so, again, generous, open, playful um, comedians, you know, and Billy Crystal is a generation of comedians that are just, wow, all I can say is just, wow. And, uh, and he, he was, he just set the stage, you know, he just set it up. He and Ron and, and Bruno set this uh, environment up and I, I just played. My interaction was, was with Billy when I said, you know, you're, you're a man in my book. Um, even though, you know, he got gored, <laughs> you're still a man in my book. I said, and that was just, just what, what rolled out. And he threw himself back laughing out loud. He thought it was hysterical. And I thought, he laughing at me. <laughs> was that funny? You know, because I didn't know the first <laughs> thing about comedic timing or any of that stuff. And so, yeah, we just kept playing in the, within that scene. We just kept playing and, and improvising. And it was so much fun to be in an environment like that. And there was no, uh, the thing that, that uh, the experience that I've had with these stars at his level throughout the end, uh, throughout my experience as an actor, with stars of his caliber, there was, never any feeling of um, like I'm a big star and you're not. It was always just people that's just inviting you in to play with them. And 
being so comfortable in who he was and being so gracious and open. And uh, it just, that was the best. And I remember Bruno, I, and we, we hung out on set, we had lunch together and the questions that Bruno, Billy would ask me at lunch, oh my gosh, and how he would put me on the spot with his incredible timing and just that mind of his, uh, it was just so great. And, uh, and I remember what uh, Bruno told me and when he gave me his, you know, his copy of Uda's book uh, during one of our day on one of our days. And it was, you know, tattered. And he just looked at me and said, this is, this is going to be the most important book that you will have in this industry, in this, in this experience as an actor, if you choose to continue in this world, this will be the most important book that you will carry in your life. And he was right. One of the quotes, just to digress for a minute, one of the quotes that Uta Hagen says in her book is, if you are well studied, well-crafted actor, you will be a well-studied, well-crafted human. And it's very, you know, something along those lines, very similar to that. And I'll, and it is exactly the truth. It began the door that opened up and connected what I learned in nature, which I write about in the book and the craft of acting. But at lunch one day, Bruno told me when he gave it to me, he goes, and by the way, we don't all make as much as you think we do. (laughs) (laughs) He said, we have cars that we have to pay for with agents. We have producer, uh, we have um, PR people, we have managers, we have families, we have, everybody thinks we have all this money, but we have all these expenses that we pay to just to be an actor, all these people that help support us and that we, you know, we pay uh, as actors. He goes, you'll figure that out soon enough. And when you're, <laughs> exactly. And he goes, and when you're on a set in some country that you don't speak the language, eating bread for lunch, working 16 hour days, having, you know, you know, sleeping on a a bed that feels like a rock, you'll know that you're an actor. (laughs) (laughs) That's what he told me. And it was like, and you know what? It was like, yeah, it was prophetic. I ended up doing a film like a year later where I was, you know, in this, you know, up in the mountain, eating bread and cheese for lunch, freezing my butt off, working long (laughs) days. That's like the perfect segue into Trigger Fast, basically. <laughs> exactly. You got it. You got it. Trek Untold will return momentarily. Trek Untold is brought to you by Triple Fiction Productions. If you're a Star Trek cosplayer looking for props or toy collector looking to spice up your shelves, Triple Fiction Productions has you covered. Triple Fiction Productions produces affordable and unique 3D printed Trek inspired products from the original series, Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, Enterprise, and the movies. You can expect the same amount of care and attention to detail in any of the items in their catalog, whether it's a prop replica for use in a fan film, or a part of a cosplay, or accessories and playsets for figures from Playmates, Migos, or Diamond Select. Own your very own tricorder or phaser rifle with working lights, the bridge of the Enterprise E for your Playmates figures, or any other item from countless species and ships from the Star Trek universe. All products are 3D printed in the USA and are constantly evolving and improving based on fan feedback. To learn more about their products, visit them at triple-fictionproductions.net or on Facebook at facebook.com slash triplefictionproductions. Triple Fiction Productions taking Star Trek where no 3D printer has gone before. What's going on, everybody? It's your girl, favorite artist, Josie's boy. And I'm Alexis A. McCoy. And we are the hosts of Call Me When It's Over. We are more than just a podcast. We are a culture cast. Yes, and you can check us out every single Saturday with a brand new episode. We're available on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Google Play. And you can catch us on our homepage at RagsWorksNetwork.com. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram at underscore Call Me When It's Over. That's right. And as always, speak up, speak out. And leave your ego at the door. We now return to Trek Untold. All right, so Walker, I want to jump ahead now and talk about your Star Trek Next Generation appearance, because that's also fairly early on in your career as well. Uh, and you appeared in Season 5 in the episode of The First Duty, which is like one of the best episodes ever. Uh, you play Cadet Gene Hajar in that episode. So can you talk to us about how you initially got cast for that role? Well, it was my first TV show audition. Um, just like City Slickers was the first film. So it was one of those moments where, uh, again, going into an environment with um, really gracious uh, 
um, casting directors and uh, producers and directors that just opened the door and, and created the scene for me. And I felt a really close affinity to that character. Um, when I read the script prior and I prepared for who she was, I felt very connected to her. I, 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 I got her. She was part of who I was naturally. So, uh, so that part made the experience easier. And then going into a room with people that were very open to, uh, to a new actor and to allowing somebody um, that had very little credit to present who they are within this character um, and just inhabit it uh, instead of, you know, having to see all the, all the skill um, from, you know, credits on the resume, all the obvious, you know, uh, let's see, what, what is the right word for that? Um, that um, makes people feel more comfortable. I, something so simple right now, it makes you feel more comfortable when you have a lot of credits and you have a lot of experience. They didn't need that. They, they were just not in that place. They wanted to something new and something, uh, I guess was more raw. And that's where I was at that point for sure in my life. I was definitely, I was very method in my approach to the craft. So when I went into a character, I went very much into the character and lived and breathed the character and opened myself up to the character. And my, my goal was just to do the character the most justice I could. And when it was a character that felt so close to who I was, it was really a fun ride to go on um, because I didn't know often what would happen from one minute to the next when I was in the, in the experience of, and she was a quiet character. She didn't say much. And I liked that about her because a lot of it was what she was feeling. A lot of it was what she would make the audience feel and the questions she was having and the conflict that Jean Hajar was going through was a conflict that I experienced and um, related to of wanting to be, you know, the best at something, wanting to be in the best um, team, be on the best team and do the right thing and then find yourself in an experience in a situation where you don't do the right thing because of your ambition and what the consequences of that could be and that you you support you you compromise your integrity um, because of being a part of a team and realize that you can't compromise your integrity that's the work i did after that's what that conflict and that look and that experience that, that uh, people have asked me, what were you thinking? What was going on? What happened to Jean Jar? You know, what happened to her? And how I see her is she, she, uh, how I would have evolved her as a character is that she became, she chose her integrity and she chose to pursue. She was either going to be a rebel captain or she was going to be a Starfleet captain. There was no other choice for her because she wanted to be the best of the best. And that moment in that scene, in that, episode was where she was going to make the decision. I think it's where she discovered what was the most, her values and what really was her top value. And that's how I felt when I left it is I felt like I would have chosen to um, come forward and not um, be quiet. And uh, that would have been her evolution through that, that she would have come forward and she would have, you know, had to face the consequences of being silent because the leader of the team forced it on and letting that happen. I had been through experiences in my life where I let people tell me what I should do. And, um, and then I came around to the reality that it compromised my integrity. So I understood, I understood that's something you do when you're young. It's something you, when you're discovering what your values are and you're finding out and just you're rooting in you're, you know, you're growing the roots for those things. And that's where she was. She was in process, you know, you know? mm -hmm. The things that you're saying are things that I absolutely noticed and felt about the character when I was watching it. Uh, and especially, you know, your performance, it was very nuanced and subtle. I guess I, I want to use the word quietude, but maybe solitude is the right word for it, because you can clearly watch your character on screen just going through the struggle. And uh, I think for a young actor, especially, it's a very strong performance to have, because uh, you're really able to show all that internal stuff externally uh, with a character who's more or less fairly nonverbal in that episode. 
but despite that, the weight of the camera is typically always on her. Like it's always drawn to her. So, uh, you know, kudos to you for that very, very great performance as character. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was uh, a blessing for sure. No question. <laughs> so how did you like wearing the uniform? I've heard some people liked it. Some people didn't. How was it for you? Oh, I loved it, actually. The thing that was funny about it is I remember when I was in with the wardrobe girl and um, and she, oh, she's so funny. The things you learn about shows, little things you learn. And she's like, okay, now we have to make sure that your bits don't show that much. <laughs> Because in Starfleet, you have, women have breasts, but they don't really show very much. We have to make you more like, kind of like flatter and, and kind of like a, kind of like, I don't know, very uniform the way she said it. And I was giggling to myself because she's like, all right, we're going to take some of the waste away. And then we're going to take, we're just going <laughs> to make it, a, I mean, it was, it, and here I was a model before where everything is accentuated. <laughs> And it's just, and so it was completely the opposite where everybody wants to see all your bits. They want to just, you know, everything's tight and everything's, you know, you're on the runway and you're doing things and it's all about what your bits do for the garment. In this particular uh, experience, it was, how can you make this garment take all that away? <laughs> so <laughs> that was what was really interesting is, is, you know, the pants were held tight with a little thing under the shoe and the sleeves were held down. So you're, you know, everything was uh, subtle very very subtle in Starfleet. we did not distract with our uh physical um attributes and uh so that's for me i love the the uh the uniform because it was such a contrast to what i spent some years doing i loved being able to it helped me in my character too it helped me really uh dive deeper into the character from that point of view i listened to everything everybody said around me i heard um, the, the nuances, to use your words, of what they were sharing with me about the show through the experiences of, of wardrobe fittings and makeup tests and all that stuff. And uh, being able to go back uh, into the archives with all the makeup crew and see stuff from the original, uh, the original uh, Star Trek. And yeah, so for me, it was a really cool experience. I thoroughly enjoyed the uniform. So you got to work with Will Wheaton as well as Robert Duncan McNeil and Shannon Phil as part of Nova Squadron. What do you remember about working with all those people? Will is hilarious. He was very funny. And uh, gosh, he was into Ren and Stimpy then. That was his <laughs> big thing was Ren and Stimpy. I, had never, I knew nothing about that show, that cartoon. And he was into them big during that shoot. And so we were watching Ren and Stimpy between scenes. He was educating me <laughs> the whole theory of Ren and Stimpy. And, uh, and he was, yeah, so he was really gracious. And so, so was Robert, all of them, everybody on the, in the, you know, on the team, we were all dedicated to what we were doing and everybody was open and gracious and uh, collaborative. We just wanted to do the best job we could. So I am nothing but wonderful experiences every minute of being on the set from from uh, being on paramount from going to the audition all the way through the shoot i can't recall one moment where uh it wasn't a, a unique gift to uh experience the history of that show and all the people that you know were a part of it had a thing for it you know <laughs> just had a thing you know there was just a thing for it so for that, I, I'm great. You know, I just was in a state of being grateful for, for being there and to be, in, like I said, invited into the Paramount uh, makeup archives and to see the mask and, and the, uh, you know, to, to be given that uh, tour of that during my lunch break was a special experience because I saw history that I grew up with. As a kid, I remember being in there going, oh, my gosh, I remember seeing that when I was a little girl on the original series. And but did you get to pet a triple? <laughs> but did I get to pet a triple? I did not get to pet a triple. I did not. There weren't any triples around where I was. I guess I didn't go back far enough into the archives to see the tri triples, but I did not get to pet a triple. I would have probably uh... had, I would have I'm not asking to take the triple because it had such a profound effect on me as a kid. Can I have this one, please, Michael? But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, it was um, it was amazing to see that. 
uh, maybe someday there will be a, a gallery showing where, you know, they will let people see, you know, fans come in and see that history of, uh, of the show. It, it is remarkable, really, what they did at that time, what they were able to do with their imaginations. So this episode predominantly takes place at Starfleet Academy, so you were away from a majority of the bridge crew, but this episode does feature Patrick Stewart and Gates McFadden. Did you get to interact with them at all on set? I didn't get to interact um, outside of just, you know, a hello. Uh, I'm a huge Patrick Stewart fan, so I was a little nervous about interacting with him, to be honest with you, because I thought it would break my character. <laughs> Because <laughs> <laughs> I had, did not want to, uh, and I, there was no way I would not be able to, because I was such a big fan of his. Um, I remember telling myself at one point when I saw him sitting across the room in the court scene, when I let myself look at him, I kept myself very focused on the, uh, on our judge and uh, the the admiral rather. And every now and again, I would glance over and see him sitting there and I would get that feeling inside my stomach like oh my gosh I'm on set with Patrick Stewart and I would go no you're not you're Dean Jar. you are not on set with Patrick Stewart right now you are on set with Captain Picard and yes <laughs> he is a uh, dominant figure in this environment he is superior to the and I would <laughs> into this and I would coach myself through it when we were waiting in between shoot you know shots and I'd let myself wander for a second uh, because I really did want to go interact with him, but I wouldn't let myself because I just, I just didn't want to. I, when I smile and when I get really excited, it's like the whole, every, the, everything just, you know, that I'm in, just, it, that's where I'm at. It's like, a, it just, it takes over everything. And she was such, like you said, a subtle, nuanced character. I could not, I felt I needed to stay. So I didn't, and by the time that I was actually done, he had left. So I went to the makeup play, uh, trailer and I went and looked and I asked if he was around and they said, no, he's already gone. And I was, uh, I was really bummed because I did want to go and just say, I'm such a huge fan of yours. And, and uh, now I can actually just beam at you, <laughs> but I couldn't before. So I didn't get to know, I didn't get to, uh, to um, speak to uh, Ms. McFadden either. So they were both sort of on the same schedule. So. Well, I hope you get to meet them at the next Star Trek convention, wherever it is that that happens again. Oh, no, me too. I would love to meet, just love to meet Patrick Stewart. I've been listening to his uh, Shakespeare quotes during the isolation. Did you listen to any of those? You see he's been... Yeah, yeah, he's been reading sonnets since it all started. So he's now, at this point, it's like basically day 60, and he's got so many more to go through. We're going to probably get to the end of him by the time this is over. Yeah, exactly. He's amazing. Yeah, love it. So this episode was directed by Paul Lynch, who directed four other episodes of Next Gen and also five episodes of Deep Space Nine. And I've heard he was a guy that was like really wound up and was always screaming before takes, you know, like in, in a positive way, not in a bad way, but just, you know, all, all about energy. Uh, what do you recall about working with him and being directed by Paul? Um, you know, I don't have anything uh, that to say other than the commitment that he has to directing and to being he was just, he's just one of those people that uh, sets up everybody um, to really be there for the, for the moment, be there, be there, be in the scene, be, you know, let's, you know, let's do this kind of a um, uh, leader, you know, he's a leader who wants everybody to bring their energy up and be present in the experience and be true to what we're, the story we're telling. And that's, that's my experience with him is that he, uh, he just had that uh, excitement for it. And his excitement was, um, he expressed it truthfully and out there and, and let everybody know, you know, where we were at that moment. Let's, let's do this kind of a thing. Let's get into this, um, let's get into this moment and really be in it and, and tell the story well. That's, that's what I felt from him. He, he was a, a good leader and is a good leader, a good director. Uh, so big job, you know, when you're, You've got this picture, <laughs> all these elements that are coming together, creating this molecule, which is a scene, you know, everything's got to come together and to have that vision, to see it and be that excited, that's just the way he did it was his way of doing it. And uh, yeah, so I was very much in my character and, um, and as he, you know, directed us, it was, he, he took the, the place of a, 
um, academy leader for me. I saw him as an academy teacher and leader, and I was following my protocols and following uh, and doing what I was supposed to be doing. That was that was where I was in my mindset. So for me, the play, the way he directed the scene and the way that he held everybody together with his energy and his commitment was vital. So from what I've been hearing, it sounds like when you were playing this part, you kept it very method on set. Like you know, you're saying the director was kind of like the leader of the academy and around Patrick, he was still kind of trying to stay within your character as well. Uh, is that part of how you approach acting? It's how I did Ben, for sure. I was very much uh, very much in, into the method uh, um, technique of acting and skill of acting. And I evolved from there into my own uh, sort of style that encompasses, you know, several. Uh, when I started studying uh, improvisation and comedy and working with uh, Roy London and working with several other coaches um, throughout my career, it, the craft evolved and expanded into several different kinds or several different uh, styles, I should say, of the craft of acting. And I think that's what a lot of actors do um, is we, you know, we, de we evolve um, in our expression of sharing life and stories. We evolve what we, how we connect with the characters throughout, you know, nothing in life is static. And, um, and yeah, so when I first learned, I really wanted to explore the most respected, you know, way of acting uh, that I had been told and shared that had been shared with me, which was method. And then in time, I, I just, I realized that I, I love to pretend and that's what I was naturally and I am naturally really good at committing to a story through uh, using my imagination and pretending. I found it more difficult to separate myself from the character when I was deep in method. It'd take me a couple days to, or sometimes depending on how the character, how long I played the character and who the character was and how the character evolved inside to shed the character. I found it, it method became much more difficult for my personal life to be able to go back into my normal life as a method actor. So I started to uh, explore other styles and techniques and involve my own um, who I was and what I learned as a child that is the truth of acting just to connect with your you know your imagination completely and share from that truth and not not contain yourself but express it truthfully and live it moment to moment be true to it now I'd also read that the New York Rangers, the hockey team, visited the set during the filming of this episode. Were you there the day that that happened, or did you hear anything about that? I heard about it, but I didn't. Uh, I was not there during that. Yeah, <laughs> it was a big deal, though. I remember. Yeah, I was not in, in the space that they came and visited for sure. Yeah, that was that would have been fun. <laughs> Do you remember yeah. anything about like what people were talking about with them visiting? Just how exciting it was to have you know a team. Uh, you know, this team come and, you know, and visit a set. I mean, how often do you have an entire team or the majority of the team come and visit a set and they're all fans, you know? There was a lot of people visiting, a uh, lot of famous people uh, in different uh, genres would come and visit Star Trek sets. As you know, lots of people that we don't even know are playing aliens and there are very famous actors just wanted to play an alien and they end up playing uh uh, characters because they just want to be in Star Trek. So, um, and they want to be unrecognizable and, and pretend to be a, from another planet because that's kind of all of our human dream anyway. So I think we're, a lot of our human dream and certainly has been mine since I've been a kid is to explore the universe. That's just, and I wasn't surprised I landed on that show because of it. Definitely. Mm, very true. <laughs> <laughs> So did you watch the episode when it first aired? I did, and it was very challenging for me to watch when it first aired. I, I had a, a hard time at the beginning of my career, even still, it's still kind of, I think it's an actor thing. We don't really enjoy watching ourselves as much as people may think. It's hard to watch dailies. It's hard to watch yourself. when you're, Especially when you're in the character and you're performing, it's often challenging. Some people are really great at it, and they can, you know, watch it and go right back in. They just have a different 
mindset and ability to do that. Um, but lots of actors I've talked to over the years have shared my um, experience of it being challenging to watch yourself, especially when you are uh, filming. But um, that's why I have such incredible respect for actor directors. They are amazing people to be able to do, uh, to put both of those hats on and do that. It's really uh, incredible uh, talent and gift. Uh, as, I've, as I've evolved and matured and become more confident and, and understanding of the process of um, and not just the actor who's, you know, showing up on set and, and sort of in that, in that, just that sphere, uh, it's easier to watch. I can watch now. I still feel like it's not me because it's a character that I created. And if it's a long time ago, a, char a character, I, I have to dig back into the files and find her. And, uh, and I do, which is, and it's funny because Cadet Hajar is one of those characters that has always been easy to find um, because she deals with the thing, uh, she deals with something that we're confronted with in life all the time. Life just is constantly testing our value structure, constantly testing our value structure. And, uh, and that's, so she's always been a character that's easy for me to, um, to reach. Some of the other characters, uh, it's like I'm looking at somebody completely. It's not me. It's like, who is that person? And uh, yeah, so it's interesting. I wonder if other actors go through that. Too. <laughs> <laughs> so Cadet Hajar never returned again in Star Trek as far as we were able to see her on screen. But uh, were you ever called back to audition for any other roles in any other Star Trek series? Um, I do believe I went on one so long ago. Um, and uh, yeah, they went with a completely different uh, type for it. But I did have one other audition, and um, and it's funny. So many people ask me about uh, Jean Hajar that she hasn't come back because uh, one of the other characters. I loved how they brought her back. Um, gosh, forgive me. Yeah, that was uh, Shannon Phil. She came back as Sito again. Yeah, she was Sito. Sito, exactly. Cito. And Robert Duncan of course, he also returned as Tom Paris in Voyager. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> forget him. Yes, exactly, Tom Paris, who I I watch him all the time because I watch Voyager, an episode of Voyager, almost every single night. Um, I love Voyager. I love the uh, I love the um, the exploration of being in another dimension, another uh, quadrant, like they are, so far from home, and hopeful and determined to get back and and being tested the way they are constantly uh, evolving themselves. And uh, yeah, so I literally, I watch Voyager almost every single night. <laughs> so before I go to bed, I watch an episode. And my husband and I, we love that show. And I've watched all of uh, The Next Generation um, a couple of times. And, uh, and I've watched some of uh, Picard. I haven't watched all of it yet. And I've watched some of uh, Discovery. Um, not very much of Deep Space Nine. Oh, we need to change that. We need to get yeah. you on the DS9. Yeah, I'm going to have to check. You got to become a Niner. I'm going to have to become a Niner. Yes, I just I just love Voyager right now, and I'll, I'll try it after. Well, I'd say as, as someone who is uh, clearly a very big lover of the craft, you'd enjoy a lot of the performances that you would see on Deep Space Nine. There's some really great, masterful performances there between Avery Brooks, Nana Visitor, and uh, Rene Abrajawa. You'll, you'll see some real, real masterpieces there. Wow, cool. I'm excited. Definitely. You know, on, on Voyager, just digress for a sec, one of the things that made me giggle when it first started, because, you know, Seven of Nine was like the uh, the big shock, because for so long, like I said about the, my whole conversation about the uniform, how you yep. couldn't, everything was very neutral, and then all of a sudden, yep, you know, yep. Seven of Nine appears, <laughs> and it was like, oh, everybody's changed their mind. <laughs> Oh yeah, polar opposite right there. <laughs> yes, yes, I remember that. And she's such a great character. I just love her character. Just wonderful. The show's really wonderful. I love the whole concept of, you know, it just is a it is a uh, a reflective experience watching Star Trek, truly. So I'm curious if you ever thought about uh the story of your character, Cadet Hajar, after the episode The First Duty. Did you ever think about what happened to her afterwards? Or what would you have yes, liked her to have happened to her afterwards? Well, as um, I would, I would have liked her to become a captain because I think that's what the track. I think that's the track she was on. At least that's what my development of her after when I thought about where she would go, where I landed as the character, and where, what she 
what the decision she eventually would have made based on what I was working through um, in my uh, development of her, her insides was that she decided and clearly chose her integrity and the truth over deception and um, following um, what her, her team captain told her to do. She chose instead to come forward and acknowledge her part and pay the consequences, but that would not have stopped her from pursuing her dream, which was to be the best at what she did and to be a leader and to be a, a, a good leader and a leader uh, within the academy. She wanted to be a Starfleet captain. That's why she was a cadet. That was the ultimate goal. And uh, so for me, I've always wondered, you know, how it would be, and like I said, everybody, uh, everybody that I talk to about Star Trek, they're like, where's Jean Hajar? Where, I, she's out in the Delta Quadrant. She's on a ship somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> she's out there. She's got her own ship because I because I thought she she would either like I said be a cap a rebel captain or she would be a Starfleet captain. And she made the decision she would rather she wanted to be a Starfleet captain because she wanted unless you know something went south with you know Starfleet leadership. She she chose her integrity no matter what, and that's um, that's where I saw her is that she. She chose her integrity, no matter what. She chose to be honest, and she chose to be a good leader. And that was more important than following um, deception for ambition. It just didn't didn't resonate with her. So, Walker, you've been in a lot of interesting things throughout your career, but the one I want to ask you about, I think, is one of the more unusual ones, and maybe you could help clarify some things about this show as well. Uh, you were in a German drama show called Die Gang. I think that's how you pronounce it. Uh, and in the U.S., it was called The Waterfront. Uh, what do you remember about that show? That's an unusual one, I feel like. Yeah, Die Gang. Yeah, it's the... Um, Die Gang. Yeah, I cannot say that at all. <laughs> yeah, I know. That was the language to try and learn. That was a very unusual experience. It, it, you're, you're right. It, it was. It was. I was a series regular. Uh, we shot in Germany in Hamburg. The majority of the episodes and and some of the episodes in um, Louisiana, so uh, it which was from Berlin to Louisiana. That's like the name of a book right there. Is exactly exactly. It was intense to uh, to go from those extremes for sure. I flew back and forth to the U.S. Gosh, I don't know how many times in that year. The German uh, the the German uh, production companies do this thing called synchronization where they when they work with foreign actors they you shoot the scene in your voice but they dub the whole thing and they're they have actors there that that's all they do and they they choose they they are known internationally as the voice of this actor in your I mean, it's a trip to say the least that was i think the most unusual is when i discovered and found out once on the project that my voice was never going to be hers and that they had, you know, this, this very evolved uh, technique of synchronization in Germany, um, unlike any other, any other country. Uh, the experience of working there was, you know, it was, it was interesting and, and, and uh, new. I'd never been to Germany uh, before then. Uh, except for, you know, modeling. Uh, I'd modeled there, but I had never lived in a city. I had only traveled to uh, several cities as a model <clears throat> for the day or for a couple days, but I hadn't lived there for weeks and weeks at a time and uh, worked so closely with the same people for so long. And, and I think from a human point of view, it was enlightening. Um, I got to go over to Eastern Germany during the experience and see a side of the country that was like literally going back in time. It was, wow. It was like I was in a 1930s or 20s black and white film. That's how yeah, different. This is only a few years removed from the Berlin Wall coming down also, right? Yeah. It was, it was definitely a trip. Say the least. 
the people were amazing over there. They were very kind and generous. I went and rode horses because horses were really a, were a very important part of my childhood um, and part of my experience in nature. And and uh, having been there for months at a time, uh, I really missed that connection in nature, li- living and working in Hamburg, which is a port city. So uh, one of the producers organized uh, this experience on a weekend for me to go ride horses at this ranch in eastern Germany. And Wow. <laughs> I know it's not the most uh, elaborate word. Well, it's the feeling you had though. I and mean, wow, wow is a pretty descriptive word. People don't realize that, but it actually is. Yeah. It, it's, it's some things in life are feeling. They're just a feeling experience. And if we're not wanting to put a word to it that doesn't describe it, that's the word that comes to mind because it's a big experience. It was a there was so much history I was walking into and experiencing and the energy of the, of the, of the place and the people, their nature were, was so different than the people in Western Germany that I'd been working with, you know, in Hamburg who, who were open and gregarious. Plus we were artists. So we're all open and we're, we're you know, naturally boisterous and, and expressive. And the people over there were quieter, but, but gent, but gracious, they had uh, a temperance to them, observing nature. I felt like I was being studied and observed, but in a very kind way, uh, which was an interesting experience. Um, and it was, it was a wow, because it was, uh, I felt like I was, I mean, I, I did go to a ranch and go into the home of these people and they, it was nothing like what I ever experienced before because it was a rock house and it was literally like going back in time and the clothes that they wore, their preoccupations, what they did for a living. It was all very much in a time warp. There wasn't a lot of modernity where I was and it gave, it gives you pause. It, it, it really gave me pause and it, brings you right into your humanity, right into who you are as a person, because you don't have any distractions. Modernity is a great, wonderful thing, but it's distracting. It's all get up from what we really are when we're just being a human being. And that is what that experience was, that these were people living off the land, farming the land, and very in touch with who they were and what what sustained them in their lives. And that was, it was very simple, very basic, and very deep. So another show you got to be on was Beverly Hills 90210. And you were there for the final season, the 10th season, in an episode called Fertile Ground. And I imagine by that point, you know, you're, you're at the midpoint, in fact, of season 10. So I, I can imagine that emotions are probably running a little bit high uh, since, you know, it's going to be the last time a lot of these folks will see each other not long after. Uh, what do you remember about being on 90210? That was a really fun, talk about a fun director to work with. Oh my goodness. Uh, yeah, that, this was a, just a, it was, there was heavy, you know, going on because yeah, it was the end of it, but it was also um, a group of people that had worked together for so long that it was like stepping into somebody's house for dinner. <laughs> and you were the one that, you know, that had only been there a couple times and uh, everybody knew where everything was and everybody just kind of went over and got their cup out of the cupboard. They knew where it was and everybody, you know, it was that kind of an environment. Uh, the cast and the crew were open and, uh, and there was this sort of sadness going on too. I felt that um, the ending of a bit of a legendary series, they really changed TV. And um, so it was a lot of fun to say the least. It was a lot of fun. There were just great experiences uh, learning from people that was new and not, not as new, but still in enough in my career, new enough in my career in that environment where I was observing and learning a lot from these, uh, from series regulars and uh, that um, were on a show that of that level of popularity. And um, yeah, it was fun. So aside from acting and modeling, you are also an author. 
Uh, we've been mentioning a little bit about your book already, and we've mentioned some of the experiences that you've had that led you towards this book. Uh, and that's called Awaken, Discovering Yourself Th Through the Light of Your Innocence, uh, which, by the way, folks, has a Star Trek reference right in the tagline of the book, which is uh, uh, The Human Spirit, The Final Frontier Within, which I love. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about this book? Exactly. Well, that is my love for Star Trek, too. <laughs> <laughs> like I was thinking about. I caught it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, there was no way that I wasn't going to include, uh, you know, include that. It just like flew into my mind, and I thought, oh, there it is. It's been there my whole life. Perfect. <laughs> um, so yes, this book was. It's a memoir, a personal growth uh, memoir, uh, and through some of the journey of my life, I I met some very powerful people this last. Uh, couple of years who encouraged me and told me that my story doesn't belong to me, that it belongs to the people that it will help. And I've had the idea of writing uh, about my life, some of my life story for years and have little bits of it on my desktop, but I, I never, uh, writing is my secret passion, by the way. I have scripts, I have stories. I started writing poetry when I was a kid, stories when I was a kid. I love writing. I've just not shared shared it outwardly, but it's something I do um, and, and just truly love. But to actually be courageous enough to put it out there and to put it out there this way, not one of my fiction writings, but, but this, this was intense. And, but it needed to be, it, it was the right time. That statement changed my perspective on it. And something just ignited inside of me and I couldn't stop myself. And the book feels like a download for the most part. A lot of what in it, what is in it rather, is is it's my deepest truth and and soul's uh, belief of what why we're here and what we mean to each other and how important we are to each other and how uh, the light that we are within each other is connected to the one light that ignites all of us and uh, and each of us has our unique expression of it and that unique expression needs to be while we're here it needs to be here that's why we're here is to be that expression and uh and i discovered for a while that i wasn't really being true to my expression um i was hiding behind the characters i was playing and hiding um and not really letting myself fully be my expression because I was challenged and by fear of sharing where I had come from and what I had lived through for fear of judgment, for fear of the way that my career had been developed, people thinking, oh my gosh, she's not who we thought she was, or, you know, she's your managers and your agents all see you a certain way and they think you're this person because, and they don't know you've been through something really challenging and it sometimes it touches nerves in people. And it scares them and it freaks them out and they don't know how to deal with the fact that this person in their life that uh, handles things so well was a runaway and came through something like that. They, and it, 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 they don't know how to deal with it. And I didn't know how to deal with it for a long time. I, I knew it was a gift that I learned from and I knew and I, I learned from all the challenges in my life. But what I didn't understand was how it wasn't just mine. It wasn't just my experience. Um, because we're all connected and my experience can help somebody the way I came through it and how I combined or how it was just sort of evolved and presented itself to me that the reason I moved toward acting, which was not a plan and, the, and got so into the craft of it was because it connected to what I learned in nature, which I described in the, in the book. Um, and it brought to my conscious mind what was in my subconscious and the combination of the two are what I use to heal my life and choose my own story. And uh, I literally choose my own story. I rewrote my story. And in doing that, it diffused the pain of it, the sadness of it, the fear of it, the judgment of it, the those feelings towards people that had uh, caused harm to me, it changed all of that. Just like we do with a character as an actor, when we look at the end result that we want that actor to achieve, what are we going to do to get there? What are we going to do? At, what actions are we going to take 
to get to that result, to get this character to that result truthfully, honestly, authentically? How are we going to get there? And exploring all those uh, potentials is what makes it so much fun as an actor. Well, that's what we do in our life, too. We do the same exact thing in our stage of life. We look at something we want, and we, how do we get there? We, we start playing with ways to get there. And in some circumstances, we just focus on what we want, and we see ourselves there, and lo and behold, like being beamed to, from the enterprise to a planet, we just suddenly look around and go, oh, my goodness, I'm here. How did that happen? It's because we were doing things in our subconscious mind to get us there. And, uh, and we, we were exploring. And we, were being, be, we were willing to be open to the exploration and open to the adventure and in the process of it. And uh, so that's what the book's about. And that's why I wanted to write it and I wanted to share it is because I use those tools consciously and very um, intentionally to create the experiences of my life. And they unfolded very much, they unfolded the way I saw them in, in lots of areas. Some areas they didn't, where I was in my subconscious, where I was being governed by my experiences more than consciously choosing what I wanted to have as an experience. A lot of us go through, I call it, I call it the floating head syndrome, where we're cruising along and we're all in our minds and we're not really focusing and connecting to our bodies, which is where the whole being of us is and lives within our whole, uh, our whole experience. So, uh, so, yeah, I wanted to share the tools that I learned um, and uh, the combination, how they harmonized and how they served me to create the success in my life personally and professionally and to avoid living the legacy that most of my family has lived except for recent, you know, the generations, but every, every one surrounding me in my generation and, um, and several of the generations following have had a hard time shedding that painful legacy. And uh, this is how I did it. And I don't think it's just, I don't, I don't want it to keep it to myself because I think it worked. I know it works. And, uh, and it's also a lot of fun. <laughs> I mean, it's clearly a very, very personal book. I mean, you know, we only have so much time in our interview today, and I recommend that folks read it to get the full experience of what you've gone through and what brought you to where you are today. But uh, I would like to throw one question to you about that fact. Uh, and I know there's probably some listeners today who are hearing you talk about all these things and are probably facing some tough questions about things in their own life. Because really right now, let's face it, we're, we're in a real period of upheaval and change, whether it's by choice or by the fact that we have no choice and the world is just an evolving place. So what would your advice be for a listener today uh, for ways that they could start looking for answers in their own lives? To remember that when we are young, going into the unknown isn't something that we ever feared. In fact, the unknown was something we embraced and were excited to experience. It's what we do naturally. It's a gift we have as a human being to explore the unknown and to walk into it expecting it to be what we want it to be. To not allow the pressure of the world around and the influences of other people to rob you of that innocence and that exploration and what you choose to learn and to bring into your future, into your next day and your next moment from this experience, because you're an adventurer in space and time. We all are. And our experiences are the direct result of our choices. So give yourself the, the gift of being patient with yourself. Remember those moments. If you're a parent and you remember those moments when you were so excited about your child holding on to your fingers and taking that first tiny little step. Be that tender and gracious with yourself and let yourself take a little step and expect it to be something new and better and good for you and not something that is worse for you because that's the influence of the world around us and that's a very contracted space to only be in when in truth, we are infinite. Our expanse 
is just that. We are an expanding being. And uh, when people are afraid like they are right now, and we are forced into connection by an unknown, unseen thing. And you and I both know there are so many Star Trek episodes and so many different uh, series that deal with the unknown thing that comes in to the environment and shakes everyone up. And until they see what it is, they, they don't know what to do and they panic and they go through all the different emotions. That's normal. That's humanity. That's what we do. We go through all that. Allow it to happen. Be patient and kind and don't stop exploring and don't stop adventuring because it seems like it's out of your control. What's out of our control is truly all of it, in my, my opinion. We aren't in control. And that's the beauty of being alive, is that each day we can make a new, uh, we can draw a new picture and we can make a new choice and we can expand ourselves into something um, unseen before and, un- and, not, and unexperienced. And by doing it, change our environment and then change our world around us. Yeah, some great advice. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for asking. I'm trying to live it every day, too. I'm right there with everyone. And not every day do I get up and grab the fingers and help myself gently. Sometimes I fall straight on my face, and I skin my knees, and I bruise my ankles. And you know what? It happens. It's what we're going through. We just got to be there for each other. So, Walker, what is the best thing about being a part of the Star Trek universe? That it never ends. And it is an endless adventure into the unknown and surprise. It's, it's the surprise of thinking you know it all and then being completely blown away at the discovery of something new. Well, it's such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for giving me so much of your time, and um, I appreciate it. And uh, it was a lot of fun, truly. You really brought me into some memories and some time in my career and life uh, that uh, I hadn't been down those paths for a while. So I appreciate you for doing that. Thank you. Well, thank you for giving us all the time today as well. Uh, You know, it's been really fun walking down memory lane, hearing about all the things Star Trek, acting, and everything else you're doing these days. So Uh, you know, thank you again. And we wish you much success with your book and everything else that you're doing these days. And hopefully we get to meet you at a Star Trek convention sometime whenever things open up in the world again. Yes, I'm working on a play (laughs) right now. So I'm excited that will be uh, in the next year or so. You'll be hearing about it. (laughs) I'm excited. Uh, Awesome. And I hope in the meantime, you start Deep Space Nine. You need need to get on that. Absolutely. I would. Exactly. That's your homework. (laughs) (laughs) We'll get into Deep Space Nine. And and perhaps you never know. You might you might end up seeing Captain Hajar somewhere. You just never know. We just never know. It would not <laughs> Oh, that'd be great. All right, thank you, Walker. Have a good day. All right, have a great rest of the day and take care and be well to you and your family. So that was our discussion with Walker Brandt, whose positivity and great attitude towards life I think really shone through in this interview. Speaking with Walker was a joy, and I hope you enjoyed hearing her stories today as well. When the episode of The First Duty was being developed, there was a lot of internal debate about the subject matter. Written by Ronald D. Moore, this episode was meant to be a bit of a throwback to his time spent in the ROTC in college. Rick Berman was not too fond of the script's concept initially, and even after he did come around, there were still debates about how severe the crime that the cadets committed would be, and what the outcome of the episode would be. Moore would write another episode about a group of cadets some years later on Deep Space Nine, with the episode Valiant, that I also recommend watching this week in addition to The First Duty, if you already haven't done that. And a reminder, you can check out Walker's book, Awaken, Discovering Yourself Through the Light of Your Innocence on Amazon.com, which you can also get for free if you have a subscription to Kindle Unlimited. If you're someone who isn't really into self-help books, I wouldn't necessarily even classify Walker's book as that. Awaken is more of an autobiography with reflections on the lessons she learned along the way with the intent of opening up the reader, yourself, to examine your own past and see where it led you, how it's controlled you, and what you can do with that knowledge to lead a better life today. All right, that does sound like a self-help book, but as much as it is, it's much easier to relate to than the typical self-help book. And if you're going through some tough times in your life these days or have some questions that you're trying to answer, I recommend checking out her book. It might resonate with you. And besides, what's the worst that can happen? It could change your life. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Trek Untold. 
And if you haven't already, please subscribe to this show. And if you can, leave a review and rating. We would appreciate it very much if you did. You can also follow us on social media. Just look for Trek Untold on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'd love to hear from you there. And of course, we'd like to hear your thoughts about this week's episode. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can check out patreon.com slash trekuntold to learn how you can keep our ship operating at full power. And you can also check out some of our merchandise at teespring.com slash stores slash trekuntold. Once again, thank you to our sponsor, Triple Fiction Productions, and shout out to Scott Ray for setting up this interview. If you'd like to book this week's guest for a convention appearance or an autograph signing event, email Scott at scottray67 at aol.com. This has been Trek Untold. I'm Matthew Kaplowitz, and until next time, fortune favors the bold.